I'm excited to follow Gloria. Um, I have questions for her for our question session because my kids have the same sunscreen issues. So it'll be good. Um, I'm today going to do sort of a big picture view around sort of what I think about surgery for melanoma and some of the changes that I think we're thinking about. So we'll talk a little bit about primary melanoma, local and transit disease, lymph node disease, and then um, metastatic disease. So I have a few case presentations buried throughout. Um, so this is a 55-year-old woman who presents with a changing mole on her back, has a biopsy by dermatology that demonstrates melanoma intermediate thickness, so 2.0 millimeters, no ulceration, and she's referred to surgery. So I wanted to talk a little bit, talking about this question about how wide is wide. So the main treatment for melanoma is a wide local excision. I will say historically, we did four centimeter margins, which is really, really big. So thinking about four centimeters on each side, this would be the size of a popsicle stick, kind of as a diameter around in the back. And there were some clinical trials in the early 80s that did, there were some done in the US, this is the intergroup study that I have up here, others done in Europe, that really asked the question, can you do two versus four centimeters, and is there a difference in local recurrence rate? So this trial, which randomized patients to one or the other, showed that the rates of local recurrence was really similar. It obviously makes a big, big difference in terms of the morbidity of what you have to take out. And this became the new standard. So our NCCN guidelines, which are the guidelines we follow for treatment, most of them now have either one centimeter for thinner melanomas, one to two kind of in the gray area, but two centimeters is kind of as big as it gets. That was a really big improvement over these really big, big holes that we would make. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still not great. So this is a simple kind of elliptical closure. Those scars under attention, they get wide. This is a more complicated advancement flap. This is better, I think, because it has less contour change, but it's still a big surgery. And then for some body places, you still end up having to have a skin graft, which if anyone's had a skin graft, it just takes a long time to heal. And that skin is never quite as robust as, it, as kind of your normal skin. And so one of the trials that's, that we should be opening up at UW within the next month is a study from SWOG, which is one of the big cooperative groups. It's called the Melmart study, and it's started, it's in Europe, Australia, and then in the US. And it's really asking the question, can we even go narrower? So it's looking at pretty broad inclusion criteria. So I would say most people who have a melanoma over a millimeter are eligible. And it's randomizing people to a one centimeter margin versus two centimeter. So this is gonna be a really important question of, you know, just like going from four centimeters to two centimeters is a big difference when it comes to your skin. The same thing is gonna be true. And I think this study has the potential to be another practice change where all of these things in red are gonna get potentially narrower in terms of the excisions, which I think is going to be a really important study, and I'm excited that we're going to be participating in it. Um, so as a second case presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about local recurrences. You know, our wide local excisions do a good job. I would say local recurrence rates are low, but they're not zero. And there's lots of, local recurrence comes in lots of different flavors. So this one has a really tiny single spot on the leg, but there's some that look like this that are obviously much more advanced. And then this one, which is even more subtle where it's in the body of a skin graft and you can just barely see this little shadow. How we manage these are really different. So for something like this, a single little nodule, doing another surgery probably makes sense. For things like this, systemic therapy, so some of the things that Dr. Albertini and Dr. Ma will talk about, it's going to be the right answer. But then something like this, where it's just this little shadow, you know, it makes sense to do surgery, but strangely enough, where this is, is on the front of a leg, that skin graft is already there, there's going to be some morbidity doing it. And so the question is always, are there other things that we can do? And so one of the other things that I think is pretty novel. It has a pretty narrow niche in terms of when we use it is Imlogic, which is one, the only, I think still the only oncolytic viral therapy that's um, approved in the US. And the idea behind this, this is a figure that even I can understand as a surgeon, but the idea is that we actually inject this virus, it's a modified herpes virus into the melanoma. It infects the tumor cells and basically kills the cells just like viruses do. 
it spills out all of these melanoma particles. It actually spills out more virus. All of that boosts the immune response to the area, stimulates the immune response to then start killing the melanoma, almost like a vaccine. So it's sort of boosting its own immune system locally in that area. Eventually your body clears it. And so it's a repeated injection over time. And so, you know, it's coming in every two weeks and then every, every three weeks and then every two weeks until it's gone or it stopped responding. So we've used this, and again, we probably use it for fewer people than the company would like, and it's because around the same time that this was being developed, the really effective systemic therapies were also being approved. But for a patient like this, it kind of feels like overkill to give them sort of some heavy gun systemic therapy. So we used Imlogic, where we just injected that local area. And over the course of a month or two, it completely resolved. And we actually did a biopsy to prove that there was nothing left. And she went on to live the rest of her life. There's other more dramatic cases. So again, this is a picture I showed that had um, more advanced disease. Started with systemic therapy and it stopped working. And we treated with Imlogic. And you can see that the disease just sort of disappeared. Um, we biopsied these pigmented, and it was actually just um, macrophages, which are immune cells that had pigment in them. There wasn't any viable melanoma anymore. So for some people, this treatment works really great. I put this up just as a cautionary tale that it's not perfect. You know, I think it works for a small proportion of people, but for those patients it works for, it's a really great option that we have that we can fit in with our other treatments. So case presentation number one, again, this is that 55-year-old with the back melanoma um, came to see me. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do for lymph nodes. Um, so on exam, her lymph nodes felt normal to me. And so what we do for people who have clinically negative lymph nodes are do a sentinel lymph node. So the idea is that you inject a radioactive tracer kind of around the place of the primary melanoma. We also inject a blue dye. Those get taken up into the lymphatics. They travel along, travel to the first lymph nodes that that part of the body drains to. And if we're going to be worried about melanoma being somewhere, that's where it would be. And we actually take those out then and give them to the pathologist. Why do we do a sentinel node? Um, you know, it's really prognostic. So if you have something in the sentinel lymph node or not, it really defines how well you do. What that means is it opens a door for when we think about doing other imaging. So making sure that we don't see things other places in the body or some of the other drug treatments. And so at least the older data doesn't show that doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy makes you live longer. But I think it's really important information that we act on. When we find something in the lymph nodes, the questions then, is it enough to do the treatments that Dr. Ma and Dr. Albertini talk about, or do we have to think about doing more surgery? And historically, when I started in practice here in 2009, we did completion lymph node dissections. If you had a positive lymph node, we immediately took you to the OR and did a bigger lymph node surgery. And the upside of that is that you know you've cleared out if there's, you know, we don't have a way to find that second tier of lymph nodes. That radioactive tracer, that blue dye goes to the first tier. Those are the sentinel lymph nodes, but we don't have a way of knowing what else is there short of going in and doing that full lymph node surgery. There's obviously a lot of downside. So having to go back to the OR, obviously more pain, drainage tubes, some range of motion limitations, and then lymphedema is the main thing. And I just put this picture up. We don't see this very often now because we're so aggressive with working with our occupational therapists and lymphedema therapists, but there's a lot of reasons not to do a completion dissection if you don't have to. And that's, and so th there's reasons behind. And the other thing we know is that when we do go back and do this bigger lymph node surgery, most people don't have additional disease. And it's because what we're finding in the sentinel lymph nodes is such low volume disease. And those lymph nodes are really selected to be the ones most at risk. So 80% of the time we would do this bigger surgery and not find anything. And the volume of disease was really low. So again, that sort of speaks to the fact that the sentinel lymph node removes the disease in a lot of patients. So the MSLT2 study, which now probably has been out for five or six years, 
was really asking this question. And it took people who had a positive sentinel lymph node and randomized them to have that completion lymph node dissection where we take out everything and get all the badness that comes with it, or just observation. And the observation is serial ultrasounds and physical exams over the course of five years. And this study showed no difference in survival, whether we do that lymph node surgery right away or not. With a caveat that there's some proportion of people who are going to have disease progress when we're watching them with ultrasounds and they get that lymph node surgery at a delayed point. And so what that tells us is for those people who might have something else still there, there's not a difference whether we do that surgery right away for everybody or watch and only do that surgery for the people who really need it. So this is our current standard. So as long as people can come for ultrasounds and regular exams, which, you know, I know I'm very pleasant, but like, I know no one wants to come see me that often, but it's every four months for the first two years, every six months out to year five. And so this is what we do. And I tell people when we follow you 25% of the time, we'll find something that's going to require the bigger surgery, but 75% of the time you'll continue. And these numbers, um, I also will say these were pre-effective adjuvant therapy. So pre anything that Dr. Albertini and Dr. Ma will talk about. So these rates might even be lowered. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about, and this has been an area that I think has also evolved. So with before systemic therapy, surgeons just sort of were relied on to do a lot of stuff that we don't do now. And so this is another place, just like for local recurrence, metastatic disease comes in a lot of different flavors. This is not a patient where surgery is going to have an effective role. Maybe even not this one, but this one where there's just this one, and actually I don't think my pointer works up there. There's just an isolated lung lesion kind of up at the top, or even this patient where, I think I circled that one, has um, just as, this is actually on the back, but um, so has a soft tissue mass on the back as the only spot of disease. So traditionally, we thought about when you have metastatic disease, sometimes surgery makes sense if you can remove all the disease. So if you get people back to having no evidence of disease and you can do it without hurting them very much. That's where these two, that solitary lung lesion or that soft tissue mass on the back. Rarely you need it to get a diagnosis. I would say our radiologists are so great, they can get us a tissue diagnosis without surgery. Sometimes it's to address the current symptom. So you have skin lesions, like metastatic skin lesions that are ulcerating and draining. Sometimes doing surgery for that makes sense. And sometimes it's to prevent an impending problem. So this is a PET-CT. That area kind of in the upper left-hand corner is a bowel, a small bowel lesion, which is going to cause an obstruction if we didn't remove it. So these are the reasons we used to think about doing surgery. Now that we have effective drugs, I still think these all make sense for some people, but there's a bunch of new ways that we would think about surgery. So sometimes we have patients who most of the disease is responding to immunotherapy and you get a little clone that starts to grow. And this isn't totally data driven because it's really hard to have a randomized trial to support this, but it makes sense that if you can go in and take out that clone that's starting to outgrow the immune system, maybe you can continue getting leverage out of the treatment. Sometimes it's that you've been on treatment for a while and you can remove the small amount of disease that's left and let people have a drug holiday. I think all of these are these new and evolving ways that we're thinking about it. And so I have one last example. Um, these, this is a patient who presented, I'm gonna try and get this up just because they're a little bit subtle on the scan, for goodness sakes. So he has about three spots down here and then has this one spot here. And this is someone who, because there were multiple spots that we could see on the PET-CT, the idea that there was likely many more made it not someone who I was super enthusiastic about doing surgery for, because I didn't think we could get rid of all the disease. So we started immunotherapy. This is what happened after the first six months. And the only thing you can really see is that small lymph node is still there. Everything in the lower leg is completely gone. As we kept watching though, that spot in the groin started getting bigger. And so this is a patient where that idea that there's a clone of disease that's sort of outgrowing things, it makes sense to go in and do surgery for that. And we did that for them and they had a strong, long period where there wasn't actually any disease. So these are all changing areas. And 
I was trying to Google, like I like to have images to go with the end of the talk. And when you Google changing area, you actually get a changing area, which feels really good for this time of year and going into the summer. So I left it there. But all of these areas where we think about surgery are changing and evolving. And they're really changing and evolving because of the systemic therapies. I think surgery is always going to have a role for primary melanoma. I think some of the complicated stuff I do around closures, that may all go away if this Melmart study shows that narrow margins are okay. Um, local recurrences hopefully will go away. Metastatic disease will hopefully go away. And so I, I think it's just an evolving area where we keep watching. So thank you.